Welcome everyone. And I want to thank Gail and Ellen for allowing this panel to take place on the Days of Learning at RS. My name is Ira Brenner. I will be the host and moderator tonight for this important panel entitled Trauma and Resilience, Adult Children of Survivors Speak Out. We have an hour and a half and I'll begin with some brief introductory remarks about children of survivors and that phenomenon. And then we have three other members of RS congregation, Karen Schiffman, Jeff Strauss, Karen Wisnia, whom I'm sure <clears throat> most of you know, all of these three prominent members of our congregation. They have generously agreed to be panelists tonight. I will pose three questions to each of them and they will speak about five minutes or so to each of the questions. And then after that, I'll have a, a brief summary. And then most importantly, open it up to Q&A so we can have a lively interaction and discussion. Uh, for the sake of uh, orderliness, uh, we ask that you submit your questions to the chat our wonderful tech person, Ned, will collate them. He will distill them, and then I will read the questions, and hopefully uh, the author of the questions can then respond and participate in the, uh, the Q&A. So, I was wondering how I was going to begin this panel and as many of you know, uh, in addition to being a second generation person myself, I'm a mental health professional, psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. And much of my work professionally has been centered around psychological trauma, especially the Holocaust. So that, um, uh, that pervades a lot of the work that I do. And I will just briefly give you two highlights of sessions that I had with two different people today, very heavily disguised for the sake of confidentiality, but just to the point. And the theme is about grandparents. One person who has no connection at all with the Holocaust is a late bloomer in life, and she's about to get married, but has been dragging her feet. Her parents, who are getting up there in years, needless to say, are hawking her and say, oh, okay, all right, when, 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 when are you going to finally get married? Uh, and in the background is the hope that they will see grandchildren. Now, they're, near to, they're nearly 80 years old themselves. And in the dialogue with this individual today, uh, she was saying, I really hope they stay alive long enough because my four grandparents played a very prominent role in my upbringing. And it would be terrible if I'm so slow that by the time I have children, they won't even get to know their grandparents. This individual is very aware that uh, having the extended family, having that involvement is just a natural part of her life and was very important and is aware that their uh, grandchild or grandchildren may not have that opportunity. The other uh, vignette is with a child of survivors, an only child of survivors, of two parents who lost all of their relatives in the Holocaust. So this individual grew up basically isolated alone, just with parents, no siblings, no aunts and uncles, no grandparents. And this was a natural thing until he got old enough to realize that there was something very odd about his family. There was nobody around, there was nobody. This huge difference is just one of the many features that we see in many 
Holocaust families, where it's not only because so many of us, especially Ashkenazi Jews, are named for murdered relatives in the Holocaust. We grew up with ghosts. We grew up in the absence of key relatives and we're named for many of these people. So there is an element of somebody's always missing, an element of unresolved mourning, sadness, grief, which is often covered over by celebration, life, et cetera, et cetera. But very often there is this undercurrent. Now, in 2013, the Pew Foundation did a survey of American Jews and Jewish identity. Many of you may be familiar uh, with this um, survey. And they found that 75% of young American Jewish people thought that one of the key elements to, to Jewish identity was maintaining a remembrance of the Holocaust. Now contrast this with a recent survey, 2018, of young Americans across the board, millennials, Gen X. And what this survey shockingly revealed was approximately two thirds of them did not even know what Auschwitz was and had little or no idea or interest in the Holocaust, not to mention the massive genocide. So as time goes on, we have more and more of a disconnect between American society as a whole and Jewish identity, Jewish premium on remembrance, and certainly on the Holocaust. We know that ethnic groups who have been victims of genocidal persecution, whether they are Rwandans, Cambodians, Jews, any ethnic group that we know from sociological studies that has been slated for genocide, this marks the cultural identity. This is a marker. So whether or not a person is directly affected or is a child of somebody directly affected, just being part of that ethnic group puts a stamp on, on that group and that person's identity that they have been victims of genocidal persecution. And this is all part of our cultural identity. And this is supported by this Pew Foundation survey. When I was in Israel for a second generation group in the late 80s, I heard the prominent Israeli historian Yehuda Bauer, who addressed us, and he said, he said something that really shocked me. He very unapologetically said, the Jews are traumatized people. We have thousands and thousands of years of Amalek and his people trying to wipe us out. And this is all part of our remembrance. This is all part of what we know. This is what we celebrate. This is what we remember. This is all part of the cultural identity. So to be part of this group, to be a descendant of a survivor of the Holocaust, even though it was 75 years ago, to many of us, it seems like yesterday, especially when people have traumatic memory. To be part of this group is a special part of our identities and everyone experiences it slightly differently, but there is something that affects us all. Every time I've been in a group of second generation people, and I think Jeffrey will confirm, no matter whether or not I have known them or not, there is some ineffable bond that children of survivors feel. Whether our parents were concentration camp survivors, slave labor camp, hidden, uh, false identity, you name it, all the whole, the whole gamut. What, whatever that story of survival is, there's just something that seems to bond children of survivors together. And that is a lot of what we, what we think about, what it is that uh, we have psychologically inherited. And in our panel, you'll hear from these three people what it's like for them. <clears throat> the first reports of 
children of survivors as any kind of identifiable group came from, you guessed it, the mental health industry in the late 1960s, originally from Canada, where a couple of psychiatrists, adolescent psychiatrists, had uh, reported and uh, published some articles on children of Holocaust survivors having very serious psychological problems, depression, suicidality, drug addiction, acting out, uh, all kinds of fears and phobias. And as our medical system is geared towards diagnosing disease, disease uh, geared towards pathology geared towards illness, not wellness, naturally, uh, and they've made this mistake on more than one occasion, and we'll go a little far afield if we enumerate all these uh, uh, errors that the mental health field has, has made, but you can well imagine, that the original reports about the prognosis of children of survivors was really very, very bleak. Uh, we were, uh, predicted to all be um, disabled, so depressed, psychotic, non-functional, that we would be further victims of, uh, of the genocidal persecution. What they didn't take into consideration was the other side of trauma, and that's resilience. And I think we're here, and so many children of survivors are here to point that out, that in addition to trauma, and the legacy of trauma and unresolved grief and the burden of sadness that we may carry from our parent or parents. Many of us have been fortunate enough to also be endowed with resilience. And as I think, as we look at this issue, it's a, uh, it's a unique blend of both of these things in all of us. Around the time that uh, these psychiatric reports were coming in, in the American Psychoanalytic and International Psychoanalytic Association were panels on children of survivors. The children of those who were designated to have massive psychic trauma, the severely psychologically and physically damaged concentration camp survivors and, and other survivors of the, the worst of the Holocaust. They were described as having massive psychic trauma. Now, around this time, in the early 70s, mid 70s, 1976 to be exact, Eva Fogelman and Bella Saverin in Boston informed by the consciousness uh, raising groups in the women's movement around that time. They started consciousness awareness groups for children of survivors. This is a historic moment. About three years later, a very important book by Helen Epstein was published, Children of the Holocaust. Helen, like Eva, is a second generation person. And Helen uh, is a journalist. She was working for the New York Times and other, uh, other outlets. And she had access to some interviews and material and her own writing. And she put forth this book. And this really became the manifesto of the second generation movement. 1981, there was an international conference, I think it was in Jerusalem. And around that time, many groups throughout the country and throughout the world, chapters were developed, including the one in Philadelphia, Sons and Daughters of the Holocaust. Jeffrey has been a charter member. I came along a couple of years after that. And in those groups, we focus on what it's like to be a child of survivors with social action groups, psychologically informed groups, and just being together to kind of share the ups and downs of our experiences. These groups paralleled the adult survivor groups. The child survivor groups came a few years later. They, they were hidden children. 
And many of them were hidden children. Many of them were not even considered survivors, but it was really the adult survivors and then the children of survivors group that followed after that. Helen, as I said, is a very talented writer. And I've just read you the first paragraph of her book where she describes what it was like for her, the memories. She says, for years it lay in an iron box buried so deep inside me that I was never sure what it was. I knew I carried slippery combustible things more secret than sex and more dangerous than any shadow or ghost. Ghosts had shape and name. What lay inside my iron box had none. Whatever lived inside me was so potent that words crumbled before they could describe. Sometimes I thought I carried a terrible bomb. I had caught glimpses of destruction. In school, when I had finished the test before the time was up or was daydreaming on my way home, the safe world fell away and I saw things I knew no little girl should see. Blood and shattered glass, piles of skeletons, blackened barbed wire with bits of flesh stuck to it, the way flies stick to walls after they've been swatted dead. Hills of suitcases, mountains of children's shoes, whips, pistols, boots, knives, and needles. Her writing was so evocative and so powerful that it really captivated the children of survivors, the nation internationally. It's published many, many times, uh, translated into many languages, and is still relevant today. In my recent book, Handbook of Psychoanalytic Holocaust Studies, I have a chapter by uh, Helen Epstein who describes her experience 50 years later, which is very interesting. I also have an important chapter by Eva Fogelman where Eva gives a much more eloquent and detailed description of the second generation movement. And I'll just read you, I mean, every word is just phenomenal, but in the interest of time, I'll just read you the last uh, paragraph uh, in Eva's chapter here, where she quotes, and I will say that uh, in addition to all of her incredible work with children of survivors, there's a special interest in the righteous Gentiles, those people who say risk their lives, risk their families to save Jews. So she quotes the late Rabbi Schulweis, with whom she says she founded the Jewish Foundation for Christian Rescuers. He understood that, quote, memory contains an ambiguous energy. It can liberate or enslave, heal or destroy. The use of memory carries with it a responsibility to the future. So, the question is, from a psychological standpoint, is it possible for children who were born after a terrible thing happened to their parents to be psychologically affected by their parents' trauma? And our studies say absolutely yes, despite the controversy. And this is what we call intergenerational transmission of trauma. We now know it's intergenerational transmission of trauma and international, uh, intergenerational transmission of resilience. So let me open it up to our panelists now. Um, all of their bios are in the program and I'll just briefly uh, introduce them. Karen Schiffman, she's an attorney in the Child Welfare Unit Philadelphia Law Department, former prosecutor. She's dedicated to public service and actively engaged in numerous volunteer efforts aimed at achieving justice for victims. Perhaps not a coincidence. Jeffrey Strauss, the lifelong member of Philadelphia. He's interested in city transportation and green spaces preservation of important areas where people can have a quality of life. 
He's now working uh, after many years of banking. Uh, he's now working for the Department of Revenue Inheritance Tax Office. He wants to make sure that people get their due, what is really due them in a good way. Jeff has been a president of Beth Ahava and Sons and Daughters, very active member. Our third panelist, Karen Wisnia, third of fourth children of well-known cantor, David Wisnia. She grew up in Levittown. She lives in West Philly, and she now works for the University of Pennsylvania. She's been a member of the RS Board of Trustees and a current member of the Board of Advisors. So we flipped a coin and cast lots and did all kinds of things as to who would have the honor of going first, alphabetical, reverse alphabetical, male, female. We decided that we would start with Karen Wisnia. So the first question for you, and then we'll ask the other two to respond, is when did you first become aware that your parents were Holocaust survivors? And how did you feel about it, Karen? So my father is the one who is the survivor. Um, I first found out about it. I'll say I was a child. I don't remember exactly when, but I knew, somehow I knew. And what I remember from as early as, you know, probably under 10, I'll say, is that, um, you know, when you're a child and you get sick in the middle of the night and you go in and you wake your parents and you say, I don't feel well, and you, they go get you aspirin or whatever it is they, they give you. Um, I learned very quickly not to go and try to wake my father because I would sort of nudge him and he would give a startle like a, <gasps> a jump. And it was eerie. It was, and I knew, that it was because he had been brutally awakened when he was in the concentration camp. Um, I just some I I just knew that. I don't know if he ever told me that or just it was very clear that um, he was not allowed to sleep peacefully, and so I learned not to go bother him. And that was a like I said, I was a child at the time. I don't remember knowing a whole lot except that he had told some stories. So there were a few stories that were very prominent and, um, and actually I'll get to, get to those in, in the next question. Um, I went to uh, conventions with my father as a cantor. We went to many cantors conventions when I was, uh, I'll say an older teen and in my twenties. And um, so I remember being uh, with other second generation people as if it was a new thing. I had not known about it before. And I'll say this was the late seventies, early eighties and maybe mid eighties. Um, and I was fascinated to know that there were, um, that we had similarities that the second generation people, um, I never thought about it really, but I was surprised to hear, for example, that uh, it was not an unusual thing to have and this kind of humorous, but that our parents would overeat butter because butter was something you couldn't get during the war. Um, or that um, our, my siblings and I became the family that there was no more parents and, and their siblings. So the survivors reached to their own children to almost be like a fill-in. So every meal was a big special occasion and every, um, really almost any time he wanted his family around him. And uh, my father made a big deal about how he wanted us to come to the synagogue and hear him sing. And, um, and it was like an almost in some ways um, felt like an obligation, um, but also it was sort of expected. We would just be going to the synagogue. It was just sort of an understanding. Um, let's see. Um, the other thing I'll just say is that um, he, so my mother became a counselor when I was in uh, junior high. And so she was learning to go through her own therapy and then she was became a therapist. 
And um, so whenever I would be upset, I knew I could, you know, go to her and cry and she'd let me cry. And he would always say, who's hurting you? Who's hurting you? And he, it's like he had no sense of that there would be a reason to cry unless somebody was beating me. Um, mm -hmm. And just by saying that alone made me kind of like realize, you know, what was going on for him. Um, Thank you. The uh, sensitivity to your father's jumpiness and um, symptoms, so to speak. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's very very poignant. Jeffrey, when did you first become aware? You're muted. Can't hear you, Jeffrey. Can't hear you. Unmute. Unmute. Here's mine. Here's mine. Here's mine. I got it. Sorry about that. I lost the screen. I apologize. Um, uh, like Karen said, it, it's really hard to determine when or how old uh, I exactly was when I knew. Uh, but I do remember some very marked moments that made me shudder, particularly around the dinner table. Uh, it was very important that you finish the food that was on your plate. If you didn't finish the food, my mother would have said, I would have been glad to have that in concentration camp. So we ate our food and no further comment was made. Uh, my mom wasn't very comfortable in talking about it, and it just came up in little blips like that. Um, as I got older, uh, teenage uh, years, uh, I became very aware of it. My mother had uh, survived Auschwitz. She had a number on her arm. Um, my parents had accents. I had no grandparents. We were a very insular family. So I, I realized, uh, I, I just knew it was always there. My father is a survivor in the broad sense. Um, he left Germany under Nazi persecution in 1938 and arrived here in 1939. But he reminded me, he always said, your mother had it so much worse than I would have ever experienced. Now, grant you, my father lost two sisters. I had three first cousins I never knew because his older sister had three sons who were killed in the Holocaust. So there certainly was a lot of loss and um, sadness around, around those issues. And as I got older in my 20s, uh, like Ira alluded to, um, I gravitated to a lot of um, Holocaust books and films. And it was uh, at a film being shown at the Jewish Y in Center City that uh, an announcement was made afterward, a Holocaust related film, that uh, a group of sons and daughters of Holocaust survivors were meeting in a room upstairs. And that was probably in the early 80s, late 70s. And that's when I made, I became aware of Sons and Daughters of Holocaust Survivors in Philadelphia, a very active group with um, intergenerational conferences and meetings of which I would let workshops. So we, we have a, a long history. I never, talked much with my mother about it because it was, she wouldn't talk about it. It was, it was just too painful for her to speak about it. Um, I felt sad. I felt a lot of, um, uh, there was some anxieties that my mom had that, uh, I'll give you an example. Whenever somebody knocked at the front door, it was, Who's there? Who could that be? And it's only more recently, after listening to uh, and transcribing and speaking about my mother's experience, that 
she relays this story in 1938. My mother's from Austria. Uh, and the Anschluss in Austria that she tells very vividly how the um, local police chief came to their, uh, their house in small town where she grew up outside of Vienna. Uh, and her mother and her grandfather were taken to the police station to surrender the keys to the house and turn that all over. And they were shipped to a ghetto in Vienna, but she said, she said in her um, audio, audio tape she made, how the fear just resounded in her when they came and knocked on the door and at gunpoint took her mother and grandfather to the local police station. Um, and that fear, you know, I look back on that story and I know exactly why she felt that way. I didn't know that early on. So my Jewish identity and, you know, my identity goes way back to that, but I also had a strong Jewish identity from just being in Hebrew school and mainstream synagogue. So it was, the Holocaust was interwoven as part of my identity. Thank you, Jeffrey. I, sure. I'd just like to make a, a quick comment before we go to Karen. This mortal fear that you described that your mother experienced, that all of our parents uh, experienced as Holocaust survivors. When that gets transmitted to us and we have this kind of fear and we go for help and therapy and therapists are either ignorant of this issue or don't know our histories, then they label us as paranoid. You know, we have these irrational fears that somebody's gonna come get us without understanding that there is a time and a place where that fear is very, very real and very appropriate. I just want to mention that. Karen, when did you first become aware? Hi. Um, there was no defining moment. I, I always knew it wasn't kept a secret for me. It was my mother who uh, was the Holocaust survivor. It was never a secret. It just was just in the background. Um, our next door neighbors growing up, my next door neighbors growing up were also Holocaust survivors. Ironically, both they and my parents settled in a very small town in upstate New York on a very small street. Um, and um, they were part of the partisans. Um, and so I grew up not only with my mother's story, but I grew up with their story as well. Um, and it was very different. Um, my mother was German through and through. Um, they were our neighbors who were like family to us, um, like second parents were um, from Belarus. And so, and like I said, in the partisans, and so their stories were very different. Um, they spoke Yiddish a lot um, in the house. Um, and so I grew up with it in the backdrop um, and it was just part of a part, it was just in the backdrop, but I never really knew any different. Thank you, Karen. I think as we hear, and my experience is the same also, it's as though I always knew something wasn't quite right. My father also had the numbers from Auschwitz and in his uh, efforts to protect us, uh, made that joke that was never really funny, that these, this was his uh, old girlfriend's phone number that he had tattooed on his arm so he wouldn't forget. And I see my sister Joy smiling longingly and sadly for our father uh, who was bigger than life. And uh, he always tried to protect us. Uh, 
never worked for me. I think it worked more for my sisters. But again, the, the issue of food and eating, and because the starvation, the deprivation, the weight loss, the, uh, the, the trauma of starvation uh, on top of the humiliation, the degradation, the dehumanization just left such, such an imprint. I would sit at one end of the table, my father would sit at the other end of the table, and we would have this unspoken competition who could eat the most, the fastest. And my father would say, Don Veri, no one's going to take it away from you. Slow down, as he would shovel it in as fast as I could. So again, these, these messages, even without hearing the stories, the, the horror stories, that we knew that something had been through something terrible. The sensitivity, the attunement, the worry, the protect, the mutual protectiveness, uh, is very much there all the time. And uh, without necessarily telling us the horror stories, which would come along later for many of us, we just knew that they had been through something really, really, really awful that they didn't want to speak about. And if we took them by surprise. Uh, bad things could happen because the, the startle reflex, the, uh, the fears, the anxieties, the, the, the trauma was, was there. Sometimes uh, nightmares, uh, loud noises at night, all kinds of things. Uh, growing up in this kind of family where things were known and not known uh, creates a certain um, unusual culture that uh, again, to various degrees, many of us have experienced and this is the kind of stuff that we, uh, we share when we're in groups. So let's go on to the next question. Any more? Question number two. What survival stories did you learn growing up and which had the most impact upon you and your growing up? Karen with a K. Um, so there were, I guess, three stories um, that I heard a lot, and and actually early on, um, one was about a righteous Gentile who walked my father across a border um, before he got put into the concentration camp, and I don't remember the specifics about it now, but. Um, he didn't have any papers and he couldn't, um, he had come home from um, being outside the ghetto when they were, oh, the family was in the ghetto and they had all been murdered. And so he ran and um, he went to a friend's and then he, um, seems like he did a few different things, but at some point there was a righteous Gentile, he would, would always say, who um, kind of, um, almost like took him as he was a, basically a 13 year old um, and walked him across the border as if he was his own child. And, um, and I heard that story a lot. And, and he always um, spoke in a real kind of almost, a, um, you know, like how wonderful that there were righteous Gentiles, you know, and um, there were certainly, you know, some not so wonderful Gentiles who were killing the Jews, but then there were these righteous Gentiles who, who, who helped the Jews. So he, um, I got that message early on. Um, he, he didn't say much, this is the second story, he didn't say much, but he talked about how he had been um, early in his time at the, um, in, in Auschwitz, that um, somebody was, came into the place where they were all, um, I don't know if you call them barracks, but wherever they were, um, and said, uh, who can sing? And, and everybody, oh, Wisnia can sing. So he was um, taken to where the SS men um, hung out, I guess, and he would sing for them and entertain them. And um, because he had been trained as a, uh, as a young child, you know, he'd been uh, quite the singer. Um, I think they were sort of grooming him to be a star kind of thing, you know, he, uh, I can talk a lot about his um, prima donna kind of <laughs> behavior, but um, 
I never got a lot of the detail. He didn't speak much about it, but he um, he would talk about how he was considered a privileged prisoner. Not that that meant that he got much more than anybody else, but at least he was not, he was spared, his life was spared. Um, I think he said something once, like instead of getting, you know, a crust of bread and some water, he maybe got an extra crust of bread or, or you know, something pitiful. It was, you know, terrible. Um, but that was, again, there was sort of a lot not said um, left to you to figure it out. Uh, and then the third story he talked a lot about, which was, um, uh, I won't go into the details, but it was basically how he, when he escaped, he uh, met up with the 101st Airborne. And he loved to tell this story about how he met these, um, these GIs and, um, and he, would, he would love to um, give a little bit of a Southern accent when he talked about Captain James Ale Walker from wherever he was from, you know, and he would just love to tell this story. And it's all in his book, which um, that anybody doesn't know. Um, his book is One Boy's Two Lives, and, um, and he loved to talk about how they um, rescued him, you know, um, and that he joined them and sort of became their mascot. And um, yeah, so those were the stories I remember. Um, I wouldn't say any of them were particularly um, clear to me about the survival part of it. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not, I don't feel like I got that uh, wasn't sort of transmitted to me, but um, like I said, he just, he didn't elaborate a lot and certainly not until I got much older and this book wasn't written until um, in the last 10 years. Um, we knew a lot of the stories, like I said, but it wasn't, um, he never was one to like open up. Um, he kind of <laughs> prided himself on the fact that my mother was the therapist and that, you know, she could talk about her feelings, but that that wasn't for him. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I'm struck by how your father uh, emphasized the, the decency and the goodness in the people and tried, evidently tried to spare you and your siblings the, the horror stories. So he conveyed some really good stuff in, in midst of all that. Jeffrey. There, there weren't uh, many stories. I, I really believe my mom buried those stories and the feelings. I also think that uh, she tried to protect us so that <clears throat> I always knew there was something more of what wasn't said than, than truly what she said. Um, I mean, I talked about when she would, we would leave food on the plate or my sister tells this story of when there was an apple core, she would mention uh, those kind of things that she'd be glad she'd have that in concentration camp. but. Um, I, I do know that as I got older and uh, listened to her audio tape, uh, once, after, shortly after she made it in 1985, um, my father and I listened to it when my mother was not around and uh, it, it caused us so much pain and grief, we shelved it. And then I took it out last year for the first time in 40 some years to listen to it so I could transcribe it and tell my mom's story. And what uh, I've learned from that and, and what she always alluded to is that her survivor skills and what I learned is that you would always keep busy. You just got to, she kept busy just cleaning or cleaning the barracks, doing something to just have these blinders on to not really know what's going on around her because she alluded to all this deprivation and death and starvation and sickness. And um, that's uh, what I remember. And yet I wanna mention that after my mom going through all of this, I, she was the sweetest, kindest, most caring person. 
And uh, it's, it's remarkable uh, that she didn't have any bitterness and, and loved people. So um, that, and, and had a special place for older folks. And that's really what came out of it for me. Thank you, Jeffrey. Once again, you know, I'm just really struck by the amazing resilience uh, in your mother also that, uh, I mean, every day I've spent with my father, I wonder how the heck did he survive? How could anyone survive? And he didn't have the answer to that any more than anyone else did one foot in front of the other, one day at a time, one minute at a time, and then come out of it and have any kind of decency, any kind of humanity, any kind of optimism, any kind of belief that uh, there is anything left uh, in humankind is, is just extraordinary. And I think this is the stuff that was not recognized at first when survivors first came here because they were all so literally shell-shocked. Nobody could hear what they had to say. Many of them had a need to talk, but we couldn't, you know, Americans uh, couldn't tolerate hearing about it. It was just too unspeakable. And to this day, to this day, we have trouble hearing it. So we all, we second generation carry around memories of our parents' horrors that they can't even put into words that we don't even know. But it comes out sideways. It comes out in all kinds of ways. It comes out in that bond that we have. Karen. So when Ira and I were talking about these three questions that he had written for us, I told him that I probably had the most to say with question number three. So I'm going to reserve most of my time for question number three. But um, in our conversation, I did, it gave me an opportunity to really think because I've never been asked these questions before. So um, it wasn't so much that there was a story or that, uh, there, again, there was no magical defining time where all of a sudden, you know, I woke up one day at the age of five and poof, I knew I was, you know, the child of a Holocaust survivor by this story. It was, um, but I do remember little things. I mean, my mother was extremely strong and not a complainer at all. So it would not, she would not have, nor did she, um, talk much about anything that she suffered from because that was just not her MO. She was um, always about moving on, moving forward, uh, looking at the glass half full was a big one. Um, and, but little things I think after, after thinking about this question and then looking back on some of the things that I realized for example, like she would never eat white rice. And I remember one time I said, well, why won't you eat white rice? And she said, because that's all I ate on the ship. And that was the conversation. And I knew enough to know, okay, I, I got it. And it wasn't that she wouldn't have talked about it more or that she shut me down. I guess I was just, it, it was pretty clear. I didn't really need more information. I, I got it. Um, we would play Scrabble. My mother played, my dad and I were the ones who always played the board games, but my mom would play Monopoly and Scrabble and we would play Scrabble and I would lose every time, all the time without fail. And, you know, it was, we would joke that, you know, my mother didn't even graduate, graduated high school and that was it. And came here speaking no English as a, you know, speaking only German and some Dutch and, had to learn everything on her own. And here I am with, you know, a JD and I'm like very, very badly losing the Scrabble game all the time. Um, so little things like that. Um, she was, my mother was 
a very proud American. And so she, when the bicentennial came, she made arrangements to um, sign up for this special plate that was, you know, very like a collector's item. And she had the flag and she made sure that she knew um, all about the holidays. I remember I was working in Montgomery County and I called her and I said, hey, they have flag day off, whatever that is, but I have a holiday. And she was like, I don't understand how you don't know what flag day is. And she just went on to tell me about flag day. And so one of the things that has always struck me is how um, <laughs> in some ways, just how much more she valued being an American than I did, because I guess I didn't know any different, right? So, um, but for her, it was a really, really, really big deal. Um, and so those are just, and of course I knew about Kristallnacht because my grandfather um, was arrested during Kristallnacht. Um, and I knew about his role in the Jewish community. My grandfather was a pretty prominent businessman in their very tiny town um, and was somebody that was always helping the community. And so um, when um, things broke out, he was the first, one of the first to run to the synagogue and of course was arrested, um, subsequently did come home. But um, so it was stories like that that came out and I don't think that I put it all together really um, until much later. And to Jeffrey's point, my mother did make a video and it was probably sometime in the eighties and uh, shortly after she died, I ordered it and it still sits in the manila envelope sealed in my closet. I haven't brought myself to, to listen to it, but maybe I will. Thank you, Karen. You know, so many of us uh, children of survivors became ambassadors for our parents to help them in their adjustment to, to the new world. You know, with their refugee status and everything else. Whereas it sounds like your mother uh, was kind of unusual in that regard, where she was so proud and scooped you on so many American um, um, rituals and customs and things like that. So that, again, this is just all part of the variability uh, in our group. Uh, a long time ago, there, there was a question, is there a, a child of survivors syndrome? Do we all have transmitted unresolved grief? Do we all have uh, transmitted uh, survivor guilt? Are we all full of such rage and wish to get revenge against uh, the Nazis for what was done uh, to our parents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, we know you simply cannot generalize uh, a, a group. Uh, we make big mistakes uh, when we do that. We all have been affected and there's some generalizations, but there's just no way that one can say that we're all stamped the same way. The important thing is recognizing that we have this legacy and, and how it informs uh, things that we do. And that kind of leads into the uh, third question here. How does being a child of survivors contribute to your Jewish identity, your personal identity, and or the sense of direction in your life? Take it away, Karen, with a K. Um, so similar to what Karen said, some of these questions were very sort of like, oh, I hadn't really thought about it before. No one's ever asked, and I, for whatever reason, hadn't thought about it. And um, I think I'm going to have to say that I was more influenced by his being a cantor than his being a Holocaust survivor. Um, now, maybe there was some, you know, connection, but what I saw was him um, and what I picked up was his value, his Jewish values, his um, also great appreciation for being in America. He would often talk about, you know, how can you not even like kiss the ground that you walk on, you know, thank God we're here and we're free and we're safe kind of thing. Um, 
He was very active in the synagogue since I was a child. Um, I grew up in Levittown, Pennsylvania, and he was the cantor. He volunteered there for something like more than 18 years. I remember when they celebrated his 18th year as a volunteer. Um, he was, uh, you know, we were just always in the synagogue. When I was old enough to go to services, uh, I remember um, just being there every Friday night. At a certain point, you know, I was only allowed to go to the children's service. It was once a month, but I couldn't wait to go and be allowed to go, you know, to every Friday night because that was where my parents were and they were very active. My mother was in the sisterhood and she was, the two of them, they were just, just very involved. They knew a lot of people. They were kind of, I believe, one of the founding members of this uh, Temple Shalom in Levittown. So, um, so being Jewish was very important. My father was very learned in, um, in all things Jewish. And he, it's like he knew the Torah forward and backward. You could pick any place and he would just be able to recite it or he knew it. Um, so yeah, I just feel like that was more of an influence for me. Um, the other thing I think were big influences. So my parents were actually related to each other. They were third cousins and um, they met because when he came to the United States, uh, they were introduced by uh, other relatives to each other. And so um, they had, you know, I didn't, I kind of heard, heard that story, but until we actually saw a family tree from a relative in Israel, I didn't realize that when you go back on this family tree and you see they had um, great, great grandparents that were like siblings or something. So it's like really, you know, it's this big family tree and her family's over here and his family's over here. And it's like, oh, we're actually on the same tree in two places. It's so unusual. Um, so family relationships were very important. And um, as much as possible, you know, we really reached out to people who were relatives and tried to keep in touch. And um, so I got a lot of that. So um, even to this day, uh, we recently, my daughter and my brother are working on um, more of this Hebrew family tree and, sorry, and we, um, we found some relatives in Israel who didn't really know we existed and they're just so thrilled to hear from us and, uh, and it's really, really neat. Um, uh, the other thing I'll just add is that uh, when my father uh, had his, um, his book published, um, people had been telling him for years, you know, you should, you should write you should write a book and he was not a writer. So somebody interviewed him and got his story down. And, um, and there are things in the book that I didn't really even know because he wouldn't talk about them in great detail. But the neat thing was about this book was that um, he was so proud of it. Just it, he like, it was almost like a new beginning for him again that he, um, wanted to share with everybody. And I had, uh, my nephew created his website and we needed somebody to handle the, you know, helping him to get to send out books for people who had ordered books. And I volunteered to help him. And um, it gave us a new sort of uh, bond. I don't want to call it an identity exactly, but it gave us this sort of wonderful connection um, that he really looked to me to um, help him make sure, you know, and, and every person who ordered a book, he would like wanna know, did he know them? Where were they Where were they from? Like, you know, where in the United States or in the world were they ordering from? And, and it was fascinating to um, see his interest in this and just, um, he loved to share that with me and nobody else in the family really could share that with him. And so um, anyway, so that's it. Thank you, Karen. Jeffrey. My identity was shaped by growing up in a community of other German Jews. Uh, my father emigrated here in 1939 and became active in the German Jewish community. There was a social group called the Central Club, and there was a German Jewish synagogue called um, and that was, in, of all places, in Germantown uh, on Chew Street. So we were members of that 
synagogue up until it was important enough for me to go to Hebrew school. Unfortunately, they, they saw that as, uh, because I was the male child, my sister wasn't afforded that same opportunity. It was important for me to get to go to Hebrew school and become a bar mitzvah. So we switched membership from this German Jewish synagogue when I was probably in about third grade to the mainstream uh, synagogue where I grew up in Mount Airy, of which there were many, but the one that I was a member of was uh, West Oak Lane Jewish Community Center. Um, had a great education there uh, and uh, became a bar mitzvah, continued education. But I always remember my dad who uh, grew up Orthodox and talked about how they were Shomer Shabbat and kosher. When he came to the United States, he dispensed of all of that because he felt that being Jewish was more in the heart and more of, uh, uh, I'll say, social justice uh, kind of mission, you know, being a, a good person. So, um, by the way, Tikva Kadosho, although the synagogue doesn't exist, what, what began before the synagogue was having burial plots for um for your community and when they when they died so it actually started as a, a hevra uh kadisha and having a burial area at um the cemetery and the synagogue of the same name grew out of that and was established um so uh today that hevra still exists i'm the treasurer of that hevra uh tikva kadosho but uh, to Karen, who mentioned uh, growing up, there was a German Jewish couple that uh, lived next door to when my parents moved into our row home in Mount Airy. They were as close, my mother's friendship with this other family was as close as, closer than sisters. Uh, that was, this was a German Jewish couple. Um, we did, many things together with them. That was our community. All of my parents' friends were other German Jews. And um, they also became friendly with uh, uh, survivors before I was born in Strawberry Mansion where they first lived. And um, that, that is very much how my identity was shaped in more recent times, what I, I feel is uh, a strong identity for me is the remembrance and um, just making sure we carry these stories on. Um, my mother always said that uh, she wanted, she ended her tape in tears. She wanted people to know this really happened. And that had such a strong effect on me so that uh, all my years of just gravitating to this and processing these things through these kinship groups and awareness groups we had, um, my focus now is more on uh, remembrance. Thank you, Jeffrey. I think as you emphasize the issue of uh, remembrance as part of uh, that shared sense of mission that so many of us second generation people have. Uh, I'm reminded of the uh, uh, Israeli group therapist's uh, description. Uh, her name is Dina Warden. Her description of children of survivors is memorial candles. And uh, we remember whether we want to remember or not. Uh, I remember one time when one of my daughters was uh, quite young and I was very involved with uh, Dr. Judith Kestenberg uh, in research and papers and presentations. And uh, one night when Dr. Kestenberg called once too many times, my daughter said, uh, Dad, uh, this is Dr. Pestenberg again. You know, isn't it time to move on? <laughs> uh, would that I could. So anyway, Karen. So your question has a couple parts. Um, 
and the lawyer in me, of course, is going to dissect it. Um, so how does it affect my Jewish identity, uh, or my personal identity? Um, my mother was uh, very much um, into tradition and keeping tradition family, which was discussed earlier, um, being together for the holidays. Um, the family that I mentioned a few moments ago, like what Jeff was saying is they were as close as closer than you know blood relatives and so we spent a lot of holidays with them they had a really big family our family was pretty small um and having those traditions was very very important um Marrying Jewish, while it um, was it was important to my mother, um, that uh, my sister and I both marry Jewish. Um, no cremation. I know that in Jewish um, tradition, I mean, cremation is not something that is done, but I also know that in more recent times, some people are being cremated for whatever reason. And um, my mother was adamant, I once asked her, and she likened it to the crematoriums. Um, so my Jewish identity was, again, like I said a few minutes ago, the family next door that we spent a lot of time with spoke Yiddish um, in the house a lot. And so, um, while we didn't, we'd go to synagogue every week, um, we did observe all of the holidays and my mother made it, I mean, both of my parents for sure, but more my mother made it very clear um, that we were, you know, about our Jewish identity. And growing up in a small town at the time when I came, when my parents moved to this town, there were three thriving Jewish synagogues, an Orthodox a reform and a conservative synagogue. By the time I went to Hebrew school, it was like Little House on the Prairie, and there was, you know, everyone was in the same schoolhouse from like the age of five to 13 from everywhere in the town doing Hebrew school together. And so in public school, there were really one or two other Jewish people. And so I did experience a little bit of anti-Semitism, not a lot, but a little bit. Um, but I think the the biggest thing for me is, and something that I have been aware of, um, even long before the, um, this program and thinking about some of the other questions is, you know, how does, how, how did be, how does being a child of a, of a survivor affect my direction in life? And that is um, crystal clear to me. I mean, I, as, as Ira read, I'm a former prosecutor. I um, work for the city of Philadelphia and in the child welfare unit working with abused and neglected children to try to get justice for them. Um, I'm a volunteer um, with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC. Um, I've been a child advocate for years as a volunteer. Um, I uh, teach civics to fifth graders. I'm very, very involved in community and giving back. And that is, that is both of my parents, not trying to shortchange my dad here, who was not a Holocaust survivor. Um, that was definitely both of my parents. But um, so giving back to community and um, is, you know, how I was raised, but the, but being the daughter of a Holocaust survivor means, as Ira alluded to earlier, there's a resilience, there's a, there's a, there's a will in me that I don't see in many other people. And maybe it's the German in me. I'm, I've always been unsure if it's the German in me or the Holocaust survivor um, part, I'm not sure. Um, but there is this drive in me and there's this, I'm never gonna give up that I know I get from my mother. Um, as my husband, who is on the call, so he can he can chime in. Although I'd rather he didn't. That he, um, you know, often says, "I'm a dog with a bone," and um, you know, I, I do think that I get that from from her. 
Um, so remembrance and education and making sure that um, people don't forget and understand um, about the Holocaust is very, very important to me. And that is why I um, volunteer with the museum. Um, so everything I do in life about everything about who I am and the way I think and the way I process information and what I do for a living, it all has to do with my parents. And as I like to say, being, you know, the daughter of the greatest generation and um, for sure, my mother being a survivor. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Jeffrey and Karen, for your candid, open, and heartfelt sharing with the RS community and friends and family here. Uh, I know it's very, very much appreciated. It's amazing how time flies. We have uh, 28 minutes, no, 18 minutes, 17 minutes. Uh, so rather than me continue to talk right now, let's see what kind of questions we have. Ned, have you sent questions over to me? Um, may I read them? May I read the first one? Please. Okay. Um, and, and tell us who it's from too. This is from Michelle Harrop. I hope I'm saying that name right. Jeffrey mentioned how painful it was for him to listen to his mother's recording. I'm wondering, uh, how our panelists feel about what and how much your Holocaust survivor parent uh, did share. Did you wish they had shared more, less? Did you feel they, did you feel protected by what they withheld? Good question, thank you. Uh, Ned, how, about how many questions are there so we can budget our time properly? Sure, we've got a total of four so far. Okay, three. and sorry, I also three. Three. want to save a few minutes for, uh, uh, Eva Fogelman, who I see, uh, is here tonight, and she's one of the legendary founders of the second generation movement, who I mentioned before. So, whether she's officially asked a question or not, we we want to give her uh, a little time. Okay, panelists, do you want to uh, respond to, to the question? I'll answer. Um, I do wish I knew more, um, and I'm. I blame myself for not asking more questions. Um, I, I do wish I knew more. I wish I was, uh, I don't know, more astute or wiser or something when I was younger to ask more questions and I didn't. Um, so I do regret that. I'm grateful that she, my mother made the tape and I'm grateful for my 101 year old aunt who has the memory of an elephant. Um, and has shared a lot with me over the years. I also had the privilege of going back to Germany in my mother's hometown with my mother and my aunt um, and some of our, our extended family from Israel and other places. Um, and so that was an amazing, amazing opportunity to go visit that small town through their eyes. Thank you. I'd like to add that I, I took my mom to these uh, intergenerational dialogues that we had and she would listen more than she could ever talk. And of course, I wish I knew more, but I didn't feel it was, um, I tried to have her talk, but there were very, very painful feelings that she had and it wasn't for me to, uh, pull them out and uh, the times that, you know, it did come up, it was just very, very uh, emotional for her. So that um, I was glad that she partook and was open to come to these things. And she, she really got a lot out of other people talking and listening and saying that she could relate to their stories. Um, there were friends of hers that had different and stronger personalities that they were almost like a spokesman for her. And uh, she felt good about that and so did I. But of Thank course, you. I would have loved to know more. 
<laughs> Karen, do you have a quick comment about that? Yeah, I would say um, actually throughout my life, I would say it's different. Um, earlier when I was younger, I don't know that I would have wanted to know more. It was obvious that I was being spared. Um, and it was hard to know how to find out more. I know at one point my father was starting to give um, more uh, talks. And when he came to Road of Shalom one time, um, and I heard the story again that I'd heard many times before about how he came home and found his family murdered. Um, and I, I think I asked him some sort of a question. I don't remember exactly how I asked it, but he said something like, he purposely was not going to get into how he felt about it or um, the details of it. And that he was only asking, uh, he was only going to talk about how could this have happened in the world? You know, how did, how did it come to this? How would, how would um, people let this kind of thing happen to the Jews? Um, he would not get into the uh, sort of the, the deeper feelings because he kept those things kind of very hidden, locked away. And um, one of the first times he spoke at Road of Shalom, he got all choked up when he told this story. And we were all in the, um, the Rabbi Weiss's study and there was a, quite a number of people in the room. And, it was like dead silence because we all could see how he hadn't really let out feelings like that. And it was very powerful for me because like I said, you know, rarely ever showed emotion like that. And um, when you see that and how painful it was, and he could, he just, you could see that he couldn't speak about it even. He just, it was obvious what was going on for him. And it made me think, I don't want to ask because it's too upsetting and I don't want to put him through that. Yeah. Thank you. Ned, do we have another question? Yes, uh, so we've got another about four questions. They've been popping up. Susan Kleiman asks, each of you mentioned that you did not have extended families. Were there surrogates? Uh, for the extended family. We're, we've heard some of that already. And I'll say I have an extended year. family, but only on the one side. So mm -hmm. my mother had a very large family, and so those became all my relatives. And so every event from Thanksgiving to Hanukkah to Passover, we always had a large crowd, but it was one side of the family. Um, my father did have his Two of his aunts moved to the United States just before the war, so he did not lose everybody. And so there were lots of cousins um, that were um, much older, and we um, didn't see them as much, but definitely had he had relatives. So, What's interesting in my family is that, um, I mean, who's really close to a, a second cousin? That's... Um, I mean, when we were small, it was our great aunt in, it was my mother's mother's brother and sister who survived. And um, the sister lived in, which was my great aunt was in New York and the great uncle who I don't, I never met, lived in Israel. Um, but who my closest relative are second cousins that I am in touch with because they've been a part of the family, but who could say they may not even know their second cousins. Karen, you have anything you want to add or should we pass and go to the next question? You can pass. I mean, I think I talked about it. Yes, thank you. Ned? Okay. Yeah, let's move on. And I think we may have touched on this a little bit too. Ellen Poster's question. Uh, did your parents ever talk about their view of God after the trauma of the Holocaust? My father had a story, he, some of you probably know it, where he um, talked about when he was in the concentration camp and there was a, um, an SS man who had a, a belt buckle that um, this was a very big man. And my father, I don't know if he was beating him at the time or whatever, but it, on the bu belt buckle, it said, God is with us um, in German. And my father said, you know, God is with you? No, you know, no way. Um, 
he didn't talk about God in a way that made me think he necessarily believed there was a God, but he would tell that story as if to say, if there is a God, he's, he's with us. Okay, me too. Would I add anything? No. God was with us in our family. Um, but it was always questioned how or why did something like this happen? Um, I mentioned my father was religious when he came here. He was not so religious, but that didn't lessen his belief in God or going to synagogue, particularly on high holidays. Um, my mom didn't really grow up with any religious education at all, um, but of course was persecuted for being Jewish. Uh, my mom always said at, um, at uh, Yom Kippur that she said she fasted enough in her life, so she didn't feel like she had to fast on Yom Kippur. Okay. Karen, so. or shall we pass? I don't think that we ever really had that conversation. I mean, my mother was um, very attentive to the Jewish holidays and going to synagogue and observing them. And I don't ever recall us having a conversation about her not believing in God. So I, I don't, never had that conversation. Okay. I don't think, yeah. Ned? Yes. So we got two more, uh, two more questions. The next one is from uh, Eva, Fo uh, Eva Fogelman. How are your children reacting to being three Gs, third generation? Well, I'll just say my daughter is in college and um, she hasn't embraced it yet. Uh, although I have uh, a nephew, of course, who's, um, probably old enough to almost be her parent. I was a very older parent. So um, um, my nephew is very interested and involved with the three Gs, but um, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily true of my other uh, nieces and nephews. It's kind of interesting how, um, I think it's a, like a personal thing. Either of the two of you want to add? If not, I'll make a comment and then see if Dr. Fogelman wants to, to add to this. Uh, my children seem to have radar for other 3G people. And the fact that two sets of their in-laws are watching this tonight uh, with their Holocaust backgrounds, I think uh, speaks for itself. I think that the uh, uh, whether it's uh, actively uh, champion through uh, organizations or social action, whatever, but the, the identity uh, in our children is, is, is quite strong and uh, they find amazing people through that legacy. Hi, Eva. Uh, would you like to say a word to us tonight? E Eva and I have known each other for many, many years. We, yeah, uh, we first have worked all, with Dr. Kestenberg and uh, Eva, as you know, has made enormous contributions. Uh, first of all, uh, my household also identified with, uh, with Dr. Kestenberg making all these phone calls. I would get phone calls at seven o'clock uh, in the morning, most mornings. And by that time, she had already read quite a few Holocaust books and depositions of, of child survivors. So I think that for both of us, uh, she was just an amazing, amazing uh, role model, and we each continue her work in a, um, you know, in our own daily lives. But uh, she was really uh, very special to, uh, you know, to both of us. And uh, first, I want to thank you, Ira, for just setting this session up and just being so sensitive to. Um, to I think the openness of uh, each of the participants really has to do with you know with your sensitivity uh, and non-judgmentalness to um, to uh, to people who were struggling with what it was like to grow up with Holocaust survivor parents. 
one of the things that really strikes me in uh, in the three in the four families that you grew up in is that despite everything that uh, and your parents went through the persecution and being victims, they were not people who went around uh, continuing to be victims, and that they seem to have a lot of love to give, and uh, that's one of the things that's very surprising. Uh, because, you know, we have this theory if people are persecuted, they too become persecutors. And I think that what people tend to forget is that our parents grew up in very loving homes and that it is that early childhood love that they had experienced as children that they indeed were able to overcome their persecution and uh, and give us you know the love that they um, that they were able to transmit and so that you know in terms of who you all uh, became as uh, as individuals as well uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that as children of, of Holocaust survivors uh, who are the recipients of our parents' memories, whether we knew the details or didn't know the details. One thing we do uh, feel very strongly is indeed that we are mourning people that we never we never knew. And ultimately, the, the end process of mourning is some kind of a search for meaning. And it's very clear that in each of your... Uh, in each of your lives, there is this sense from morning comes come some kind of a sense of responsibility, whether it's remembrance or making a difference in the kind of work that uh, uh, that you're doing. And um, so I think that, you know, we have David Lee Preston here with us, who certainly has spent, you know, much of his adult life, uh, both as a uh, reporter and also coming from Wilkes-Barre, uh, uh, Wilkes uh, I don't mean Wilkes-Barre, I mean um, uh, Delaware, um, having continuing the, uh, the garden of the righteous uh, that, um, that his mother had began in terms of remembering those rescuers uh, that saved uh, Jews and some of you had parents who also continue to um, remember those who risked their lives to, uh, to save us. And so that as we remember, we don't only remember the evil, but that we also remember the goodness and that in every situation where there are victims and oppressors uh, and resistors, they will also be uh, people who are um, who are good, who risk their lives, their family's life, uh, because they feel that it is the right thing uh, to do. And I hope that all of you continue to um, to do the work that you're doing uh, to make a difference in your uh, in your community. And that you know you're talking about the children not being that involved, uh, you know, in their twenties. I don't think that, you know, we expect as much, you know, some of that identification and going through this mourning process, I think does not happen till, till later on in, uh, in life, you know, that right now in the 20s is more of a process of separation and individuation, and it is later on that uh, there will be more of an identification uh, with uh, with one's family uh, family history, so Either thank, thank you, Ira, for yes, giving me an you. opportunity Absolutely. to say something. Uh, uh, it is so clear that we all, if we had the time, could go on for hours and hours and hours. It's good to see you, Eva. Good to see you, David. Family, friends, members of the larger RS community. It's really been a, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity, and thank you all for your attentiveness. If any of you have any questions or would like to continue any part of this dialogue further, by all means, get in touch with me. And I'm sure the panelists would be very receptive also. And Eva, thanks again for your participation. And I think we should sign off now. And we will look forward to the next time. Thank you.